Hello, hello. This is Carl Tech coming at you live from the blockchain. Um, today, we're going to talk about a lot of optimistic stuff. And so let's dive right in. All righty. So optimistic roll up. You may have heard of it before. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the optimistic virtual machine. In fact, we're going to talk about everything together in the package optimistic Ethereum. And so let's dive right in. So we have Ethereum and unfortunately right now there's, you know, it's got a bit of a ball and chain because of the latency and the throughput. Latency for Ethereum is like, you know, 15 seconds in the best case. That is not, that is just too high. We want it to be five seconds. The throughput is insane. The, we absolutely need to increase the throughput. This is the price fees um, over the past while. It's been just going off the charts. And so we need, we need more. In fact, we need 10, you know, 100x more, probably more than that. So how? How do we do this? Well, dun, 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 dun. of course, we cut that with optimism, uh, <laughs> optimistic Ethereum, and we're good. But okay, we haven't actually gone into any details. So how does this stuff work? We're going to talk about both of those two things, throughput and latency. First, we'll start with throughput. How do we get a little bit more throughput. So scaling throughput with optimistic rollup and the OVM. That's our first section. So Ethereum L1 scalability. This is kind of a recap of why Ethereum layer one doesn't scale. We have all of these different nodes and they all, you know, there's some percentage of uh, good nodes and bad nodes. And we have some kind of gas limit, some throughput uh, rate limiting thing. And as we increase the throughput, because all of the nodes need to process all the transactions on the network, some of these nodes start going offline. And in fact, if enough goes, nodes go offline, then we have a 51% attack. And there is, you know, clearly here, there are more dishonest nodes than the single honest node right here. And so this is, this is, not, this is not good. And so we actually have to reduce the number, the total throughput. It's very sad. Um, so that all of the nodes can participate. Now, if we go inside of one of these nodes, what are they actually doing? What is the transaction cost coming from? Well, they receive a raw message, they download the transaction, and that kind of costs some amount of money. Then what they do is they start pr processing the transaction and they update their state, right? And that costs a whole lot of money. Uh, the state updates, the, you know, the actual computation itself, um, and then they compute a kind of block hash and block header and stick it in a block and then propagate it. So this is, you know, at a high level what happens on L1. But let's talk about L2 scalability. So if we zoom out again, we can see that there are multiple nodes connected, these L2 nodes connected to the L1 nodes. And in fact, they can, you know, they don't have to be connected one to one like this. It just is like that in this video. Um, however, what the, if we look in a kind of you know, closer, closer view, now when messages hit L1, what happens is they download the transactions and they just store them. They don't actually do any processing. They skip the processing step. They skip the state update step. And then what happens is that message gets propagated to an L2 node. And inside of the L2 node, that is where the actual processing gets done. That's where the state updates happen. And that's how you know, we calculate the state route. Now, of course, there's also a validity game that is played on L1 to make sure that these, these fingerprints or these state routes are the correct state routes. Um, but we won't get into the details of that. You can look up kind of the optimistic roll-up uh, validity game in, uh, in other places. And so this is actually an example of parallelism because in the system we have two different, you know, uh, two different systems that are running in parallel. You can still send transactions to L1, but you also now have the ability to send them to an L2 chain. And that is really nice. So we have all of these nodes that are all parallelized. Another thing is we can actually scale up raw compute performance. And this is a little bit tricky. This, you wouldn't necessarily think of this. So the um, layer one compute requirements, right, as we scaled them up, we you know, couldn't really go very far before we started hitting, uh, hitting some 51% you know, attack limits. However, on L2, we have the same property where we can scale up the gas limit. Um, 
And so we're, you know, the, but the difference is that in L2, there is only one honest node required in, in, you know, in, on L1, we need 51%. We need, you know, even more in proof of stake. Um, however, on L2, it's just one. That's it. So what can we do? Well, if we start scaling it up, you'll notice that here, here we already, we still have our one honest node, our one honest L2 node. Now, of course, here we had a 100% attack, right? Because we scaled it up too far. This was like to the max. But if we just scale it down a little bit, we still actually have the ability to have a safe network in you know, more adversarial conditions. And this is how we can kind of get actually, you know, higher throughput, I mean, higher scalability um, on L2 than like, than L1. And that is a kind of like inherent property of L2. And so, woo, yeah, we're, we're super strong in L2. Um, and in fact, when Ethereum V2 comes around, and I'm not going to talk about this in this talk, um, but that gives us even more super scalable, you know, uh, uh, weightlifting peeps. Hooray. So that is kind of how the throughput happens. But the one problem with this is that it's actually non-trivial to support all of these developer to all the Ethereum developer tools. And we need them, right? We need the EVM. We need Spiddler. We need Solidity. We need all the block explorers. Um, you know, this is, this is critical to the Ethereum ecosystem and composability. And it's actually a bit tricky. Um, so when we go back here, this is what is tricky. It's very tricky to get the EVM to be what is run off chain because we need what is run off chain to, in the worst case, run on chain. And that's because of the fraud proof. That's because of the validity game. And so this is actually, this whole step is really, really tricky to do, but we can do it, thankfully. Um, and the, one of the easiest ways to do it is using container virtualization. So essentially what that looks like is it's Docker plus the EVM. So what happens is we have our off-chain node running the transaction in the OVM. And in the worst case, we can send that OVM, optimistic virtual machine, to the EVM. And it can actually be run inside of the EVM. And it doesn't escape the sandbox, right? The whole point of containerization is it just keeps it you know, contained inside of a little sandbox. And so that actually gives us the ability to guarantee the validity of an L2 EVM and use the L1 consensus. So we get, you know, the same development experience across all of these systems. We get all the things. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, that's the first section. That's throughput, right? That's throughput and the EVM. Now let's talk about reducing latency with sequencers and Neva. Very exciting. So sequencers, what's a sequencer? Well, it's basically a relayer plus plus. It's a relayer plus some crypto economic guarantees. So here's our little, here's our sequencer. And we can, you know, we have our uh, a user who sends a, tr a transaction to the sequencer. Notably, relayers um, are, already a you know popular popular thing they use you know uh, users sign meta transactions and broadcast them to relayers who then relay those transactions back to the network and so you know you have a user send a transaction to a sequencer or a relayer technically and that will uh, that sequencer will send the transaction directly to the ethereum chain but before they even do that what they will do is they will take a they will sign a receipt and the receipt will commit to inclusion of the transaction and the ordering of the transaction. And they will send that receipt directly back to the user. And the user will verify that the signature does indeed check out and is from the sequencer. Now the sequencer has included the transaction and everything is happy. And the reason why this is great is because the user immediately gets this guarantee, you know, this commitment to inclusion and ordering. Great success. Now, if we do that again, but instead, we have a malicious sequencer, well, they might be able to, they might break their commitment to ordering by sending another transaction in first and breaking that transaction. So that's, that's no good. Or they might not, you know, include the transaction at all and just throw it away. What, what's going to happen is the user is able to just look at Ethereum and send the receipt to an adjudication contract on L1 that contract looks at the, the chain and then slashes the sequencer. 
burning their bond. And so this is a kind of technique that is used in proof of stake. And is, it, this is almost, you can almost think of it as like a very small, you know, very attributable um, proof of stake system. And now you have a bunch of sequencers. So if one goes down, right, one of them is malicious, you can always send to any one of, you know, of the many others. Or you can just send directly to the Ethereum main chain, just like with a, you know, uh, a, a relayer. Um, you can always send your transaction directly to L1. And, you know, it'll get mined and, and everyone's happy. So even in the worst case, it's not so bad. Even greater success. So... Um, the, way, the way to kind of think about the benefits of this is that you can see on L1, you have this kind of slowly increasing cost of reverting uh, a block. But when you get these immediate promises, that gives you an immediate bump in the cost of attack. And actually, notably, this is also the same in, you know, if you're, you know, in proof of stake, where you can get immediate promises saying, oh, I, you know, I'll include this. And that's you know, why the transaction latency actually goes down. Um, in proof of stake, but we can get that even before um, ETH2. And additionally, we can talk about like the actual latency. So the inclusion latency. So when the the time for a transaction to be included in the chain is a, you know is less than two seconds when you get these commitments. However, of course, it defaults if in the worst case, if you you know if the sequencer is bad, to you know two fifteen seconds the Ethereum block time. Similarly, the confirmation latency in the average case is you know two seconds, and the confirmation latency where you know kind of the ordering latency is a little bit longer in the case where you you know uh, where the sequencer is bad um, you know two minutes it's still pretty pretty comparable but what we're doing is we're basically getting the most out of this average case or this you know this best case um, and you know hoping that the worst case doesn't happen all that often um, but even if it does we can gracefully recover so finality requirements remain unchanged and I mean, and so this, the, you know, the general structure of the blockchain doesn't change. It's just a kind of extra layer for extra, you know, low latency. And there's a bonus section. So funding public goods with minor fees. So the, uh, uh, and this is a little bit of a, you know, hippy dippy section, you know, I must confess. Um, so one thing that we like with the sequencers is they actually enable us to kind of re-engineer the incentives around mining because that's the kind of L2 miner. And so users normally on L1, you know, use dApps and that pays miners, but developers make those dApps and they have to figure out a way to actually, you know, sustain themselves. And so this is a kind of like kind of messed up system because all of the money is just going to these miners who aren't necessarily producing the, you know, the dApps. And so we can actually introduce this. And this is, this is a concept called MEV. Now imagine there's a world <laughs> where, um, <laughs> where instead you have miners having to pay back the you know transaction fees essentially to developers or maybe just everyone maybe all the public goods you know uh funding needs and you know the world will be happy and we'll all achieve universal consciousness anyway there's there's a possibility you know a possible solution mev uh auctions and this is uh you know something to to be excited about coming in the future um, and a way to organize and elect sequencers. So with that, we have optimistic rollup, the optimistic virtual machine, Miva, you know, optimistic rollup, scaling throughput, optimistic VM, uh, enabling the EVM on you know, this optimistic setting. And then Miva, uh, this, you know, the ability to you know, lower latency and fund public goods. You take them all, put them in a pot, shake it up, sh poof, you get optimistic Ethereum. Um, and so that is a high level description of optimistic Ethereum. Thank you.